Welcome back to Dude We Can Build It. Today we are framing the interior walls of the house. We're adding three bedrooms, two bathrooms, and a laundry room. The living room kitchen area will stay open and the ceiling will be exposed trusses. We're going to come back later and add spray foam and then paint it all black for a modern industrial look. So we're ready to start putting walls up inside the building. And the first thing that we need to do is start laying out our walls so that we can assemble them on the ground and then stand them up into place. So I'll get two boards of the same length, one treated base plate and a non-treated top plate. I'll make sure that the ends are nice and flush. And then I'll go ahead and start marking out our stud locations. To begin, if this is an end wall, I'm going to mark at one and a half inches. This is going to be our very first stud. And then I'm going to proceed marking every 16 inches all the way down the length of the board. Now that we have our mark at every 16 inches, I'm going to use a square to transcribe this mark across both boards at the same locations. Next, I'm going to indicate which side of the line the studs are going to be on. So this very first stud is the only one that's going to be on the left-hand side of the line. After that, we're going to mark our stud locations to the right. Now, if we measure from the center of this stud location to the center of this stud location, you can see that we have a perfect 16 inches. If you wanted to, you could also come here and you could mark at an inch and a half. Transcribe that line and you'll have both sides of your stud clearly marked. However, I don't normally do this because it takes extra time. If you have one line and you know which side the stud is going on, that's all the information that you need. Now let's say that this wall is starting in a corner and so it's going to have another wall come out of it. We're going to need to put a California corner right here or an energy efficient corner that will take the place of the dead wood and also give that other wall something to attach to. to do this we simply measure five inches from the end of the board then we measure an inch and a half in and we draw our line across this this is our deadwood stud location now anything that you mark on the base plate you need to mirror it on the top plate if it's on the outside here it needs to come to the outside here and also if it's on the inside then it needs to come to the inside so we'll do the same procedure here we'll mark five inches then we'll mark an inch and a half and we'll place our adjoining stud here. So when we flip these together in a clamshell action, all of our stud locations will match up. So now I'm going to show you how to do a rough frame in for a door. Let's say that we want to place a door right here and we have all of our stud locations. We can go ahead and measure out our inch and a half and find the other side of this stud here. And then we'll butt up a jack stud right next to this. Now what a jack stud is, is a stud, but it's not full length. Say if we have a 36 inch by 80 inch door, then our rough opening needs to be two inches wider, which is 38 inches and two and a half inches taller. So that'll be 82 and a half inches. So our jack stud, which is going right here, will be 82 and a half inches. And then we can set the two by six top plate on top of that on both sides. So once again, we'll measure our inch and a half. And now we have a stud and we have our jack stud adjacent to it. Now let's say we're installing a 36 inch door. We need to start from the outside of this jack stud. We need to go 36 plus two inches to make our rough opening. That'll be 38 inches. So this will be the inside of the door. Now we'll measure an inch and a half for our jack stud and three inches for our full length stud. At this point, our layout for our top and bottom plate is complete. We will be cutting out only the bottom plate because you're not going to have a bottom plate underneath your door. So let's cut this section out and then we can assemble this wall and set it in place.
So here's our doorway that we framed up on the ground. We stood this wall up, got it anchored on both sides and anchored into the concrete with our expanded concrete anchors. We have our jack studs that were in place on the two sides that are 82 and a half inches tall. So we went ahead and put our two by six header in. This keeps any load from the top plate from pushing down on this and pushing down on the door frame. This will bear the weight. This is a two by six flush on the front and a two by six flush on the back. There's a little gap in the middle. The only thing that we have left to do on this doorway is maintain our 16 inch spacing. So here, and then probably another one here, we need to put some little short cripples in, which is just a piece of stud cut to this height, set in here and right there. And this doorway will be complete. Once you have all your wall sections up, then you need to start installing your double top plate. And that's what locks in the top of all your walls together. You can see that our first top plate has a joint right here. And then our second top plate extends two foot past it so that it can be attached on both sides and bridge this joint. You wanna make sure you have at least a two foot overlap on all the joints on your walls. Some jurisdictions might call for a different measurement such as four foot. So check with your local building code on that. Also, when you have a perpendicular wall, you need to make sure that this perpendicular wall's second top plate goes over your other wall. That way it can be attached securely at the top and then anchor it also at the bottom. So at this point, we have installed our ceiling joists, which are these two by eights here to span this 15 foot room. The two by sixes were used to span all of the 12 foot rooms. However, this 15 foot room is too far to use two by sixes at a 16 inch center. So we use two by eights. Now, when we set our ceiling joists in place, we actually went ahead and set our rim joists first. So we put this up here and we toenailed it into the top plate and we put our marks at our 16 inch on centers. That way we knew where to put these ceiling joists. Then once we set these ceiling joists in, we always use a square set on the top plate to make sure that these ceiling joists are actually square and not kicked out one way or the other. Another important note on installing ceiling joists is you always wanna make sure that the crown of the board is facing up. That way, when you put a load on it, it flattens out. If you put the crown facing down, you're going to have a dip in your ceiling. You don't want that. The last thing to do with our ceiling joists is we're going to place some strong backs going this direction, about halfway down, and that will keep these ceiling joists from flexing one way to another. It'll also keep the spacing correct from one ceiling joist to another. That will make this entire ceiling assembly much stronger and straighter and keep the spacing uniform. So we're going to build a strong back so that you can see how this process works. And then we're going to set it on top of the ceiling joist and install it. So we have two 10 foot boards. We're going to overlap them in an L shape and we're going to start screwing it down at one end. Make sure that the ends are flush and make sure that the sides are flush. We'll start with one screw down there. And then as my helper moves this way and screws in these other screws, I can move this board left and right to make sure that it's flush. So this is our strong back that we have just built. We're going to set it up on top of the ceiling joists over there. And we're going to make sure that the taller side is facing up. So what you can do to prepare to install this is you can actually mark out where your ceiling joists should be laying out. Our ceiling joists are on 16 inch centers. So we will go ahead and mark every 16 inches and place an X where the ceiling joists should go. That way when we install this, our ceiling joists will actually get spaced correctly.
So the way that we framed our windows in is a little bit unorthodox. Since we have two and a half inch tubular framing for this building and I butted up the windows to the exterior of the wall with two by fours, you can see here that our framed up interior wall and these cripples leave about two and a quarter inches from the framing of the window itself. So this window is actually inset farther than our finished wall. So we simply framed out this wall and left a couple of blanks where these studs should have been. We stood it up and then we took these studs and we just sandwiched it up against the framing for the window on both sides. Then we screwed it in and then we measured and cut our cripples for the top and the bottom, got them attached to the window sill here and to the top of the window frame here. We're going to come back and rip some two by fours down to the correct size to finish framing in this window later. But that is how we did our rough in for these windows. If you enjoyed this video and learned a few things, please let us know in the comment section below and make sure to smash that like button. Next up, we're installing the electrical. So check it out. So the service entrance is where electricity enters the home. Once we are done with the trim out and this building is ready to be occupied, the utility company will simply put a meter here and activate the electricity into the home. So the meter can itself, which is this part right here, is normally at six feet or eye level, depending on the code. Ours is at six foot. That makes it easy for the meter reader to come in and visually inspect. So the ground rods are in place and they're attached with number six wire and acorn clamps. The service protrudes through the wall inside of a conduit, which is sealed up with silicone. We have our subfeeders pulled to our interior panels. auxiliary panels are installed and all the wire is loomed into the panel. We went a step further and installed all the breakers and terminated all of our home runs. So you see all of our home runs are terminated into the breakers here and also in the neutral and ground lugs inside the panel. For your rough end inspection, all you actually need is these wires set into here. You can loom them around, which by that I just mean to loop them around where you have plenty of excess, shove them in this panel and that will get you through the rough end inspection. Outlet boxes are hung at a height of 16 inches from the floor. In the kitchen where we have kitchen counters, our outlet boxes and switch boxes have to be above the counter, but below the cabinets. So the bottom of the box is set at 42 inches for both outlets and switch boxes for the cabinet height boxes. The top of our light switch boxes is at 54 inches. These little nipples here are 3 eighths of an inch. So when you install this box, simply set it here and push it back until they come in contact with the stud. Once they're in contact with the stud, drive your two nails. This will ensure that when you hang your sheetrock, this box will be flush with the finished surface or just slightly under flush and not too recessed into the hole or too far out as to cause a protrusion in your finished product. The length of your wire should extend out of the box at least eight inches. This gives you plenty of wire when you hang your devices such as outlets and switches. Also note inside of the box, your wire sheathing, this PVC jacket, which is either white, yellow, or orange, should extend into the box to make sure that the wire is protected all the way into this enclosure. Now we're just going to roll this wire up and set it back in the box until trim out. Make sure to push the wire all the way to the back of the box. That way when they come through and they hang sheetrock, a lot of times they'll use a router inside of here. You do not want that router bit to tear up your wires. Next, we need to make sure that our wires are properly secured. We have a staple within eight inches of the box and then every four foot after that first staple. Down here, you'll see that our wire is going through studs. When you drill holes through studs, make sure to drill in the center of the stud. That way when you hang your sheetrock, screws cannot penetrate into the wire from either side side. High powered appliances such as dishwashers, microwaves, and refrigerators receive their own dedicated circuits. This outlet here is dedicated for the dishwasher. This is the only outlet on this circuit and it goes straight back to the breaker panel and has its own breaker. This outlet is dedicated for the microwave. And this outlet is dedicated to the refrigerator. The white wire is 14 gauge Romex. It's rated for 15 amps and is usually used for lighting circuits. The yellow wire is 12 gauge Romex, which is rated for 20 amps and usually used for receptacles. Last but not least, 
is the orange wire. This is 10 gauge wire that is rated for 30 amps. This is reserved for higher output appliances such as clothes dryers. So that's all of our key points for our electrical rough in. While we're waiting on this to get an inspection done, we're going to start working on the plumbing. I decided to go with an industrial solution. I installed a package unit for my AC and heating system. This means that all of my components are in one nice convenient package. I don't have an air conditioner upstairs, so I don't have any chance of condensation leaking through my ceiling and getting my sheetrock and insulation wet. I don't have any issues with molding. I don't have to run copper lines in and out of my house in order to achieve air conditioning and heating and is only penetrated through with this single duct line. This also keeps maintenance and repairs really simple as everything can be done outside of the house at ground level. You don't have to pack bags upstairs. You don't have to pack tools and parts in and out of the attic. You also don't have to work in an attic that's 100 plus degrees on a hot summer day. Everything is conveniently outside. First, I will make sure that the ground is level and well packed where the package unit is going to sit. And then I'll set my condenser pads down before I set the package unit on top of them. I need two holes in my wall. One is for my supply air coming into the house and one is for my return air coming back out of the house into the package unit. We're going to assemble metal duct from the package unit up the wall and into the house as well as our trunk line on the inside to distribute the air on the inside of the house. We had a local air conditioning company fabricate all of our metal duct for us and we assemble it with S drives and locks. So we just put the S drives on, clip the panels together, and we drive the drives in, bend them over, and then screw them into place to secure everything solidly in place. For all the duct work on the outside of the house, we will come back later and weather seal each joint on the outside with mastic paste. This is applied with a paintbrush and just make sure that no water gets inside of the ductwork on the outside of the house. On the inside, we have this nice trunk line. We are not worried about weather sealing it or making sure that it's airtight because it's inside of the condition environment of the home. So any air leakage here just goes to where it would go anyway. Where the ductwork connects to the package unit, we're going to use mastic tape. It's mastic, but it's on a rollout foil tape. And this is a lot easier to remove than mastic putty. In the case that we need to remove the package unit and install a new one, we can simply cut that tape off, remove the screws, and then replace the whole unit, and then put a new piece of tape on there. Now on the inside of the house, we've installed a metal trunk line that we're going to tap into for each of the rooms. In the main space, we're just going to cut holes in it and put multi-directional grills to provide airflow for the main room. Once we mark and cut out the hole for each tap, we secure the tap with screws and mastic putty. Every tap has a damper on it that allows us to come back later and adjust the airflow going through that tap and into each individual room. This allows us to balance the airflow in the house and make sure that everything is getting sufficient airflow, but not too much. At this point, I'm installing the flexible duct from the tap to the register in each room. I'm going to secure the inner liner to the tap with a duct tie. Then I'm going to stretch the insulation over and secure it also with a duct tie. It's important to use plenty of webbing to support your flex duct. You don't want it to bow or sag anywhere because that can reduce airflow. I like to use webbing every three feet. Ventilation is part of the HVAC install. So we're installing the stove hood vent and the bathroom vents. Now it's time to cut holes in the wall for the bathroom vent fans. I'm going to use dryer kits to stub these penetrations out of the wall. I 
I will come back later and waterproof all penetrations with copious amounts of silicone. That way water cannot enter the building. The flexible duct that vents the bathroom vent fans to the outside of the house is called fart flex. Now we need to make sure to secure the fart flex with plenty of duct tape. That way none of that smell leaks out. I'm using seven inch metal to duct out the stove hood vent. First, I need to snap together the five foot sections so that I can assemble the entire length of the stove hood vent. Then I'll use a seven inch to six inch reducer to attach it to the penetration going out of the wall. Then I'll have a 90 degree elbow, dropping a section of vent pipe right over where I think the hood vent will be. Next, I'll secure each joint with three screws and seal it really well with duct tape and then strap it with banding iron. Now that everything's in place, I'm ready for my rough end inspection and then once we pass our rough end inspection, we'll be ready to install the thermostat and the grills. I chose to go with a Wi-Fi thermostat so that I can control my AC from my phone anywhere in the world. It also supports Google Home and Alexa. Hey Google, set the AC to 68 degrees. Now that those are in place, this is a functioning air conditioning system that will keep this house nice and cool with a good balanced airflow. In this video, we're combining modern industrial with classic interior design. We're going to talk about the materials and the finishes that we used and why we chose them. First up is the insulation. We're going to start with spray foam. For large spaces, I always recommend hiring a professional. They are experienced and they will leave a nice uniform finish. Also, a pro buys in bulk and will probably cost less money than buying DIY kits and doing it yourself. In my shop house, they're going to start by spraying two inches of closed cell foam to the entire interior of the metal building. The closed cell foam is rated as a water barrier and also adds strength to the building. You will notice after the foam has cured, the walls have almost no deflection when pushing on them. That's because the spray foam is very dense and very hard. Also, the foam will seal up any air leaks and prevent drafts from entering the house. Two inches of closed cell foam will generally provide an insulation value of R13. Next, we'll add an additional four inches of open cell foam to the ceiling and all the way down to the top of the walls. Open cell foam is softer and absorbs noise inside the building. The combined insulation value of the ceiling is R26. Now I'm going to save some money by adding fiberglass bats to the walls. This will increase the total exterior wall insulation to R26 as well, which is twice as much as needed. This extra insulation will keep the house more comfortable and reduce utility bills. Notice, I staple the bats up so that they don't sag over time. If your insulation sags, it will reduce the R value of the wall. Once the foam has cured, I can go ahead and paint it. I chose black paint to give the main room a modern industrial look. Because the paint is black, it will naturally absorb light and make the room feel dark. The paint that I'm using is a high gloss interior latex. The high gloss gives the paint a reflective quality that will help to brighten the room. I was concerned that it would feel too dark and oppressive at first, but the high gloss really evened it out and makes the room feel bright and warm. Also, note that I did not need to frame and sheetrock a ceiling in this space. This saves us a lot of time and money and allows us to take advantage of the high ceilings. Having a high ceiling makes the space feel bigger than it actually is. Now, we're ready to hang the ceilings in the smaller rooms. I chose a rustic beadboard that has tongue and groove for easy installation. 
I was able to purchase this material at Home Depot and it already had primer on it. With the help of a few friends, we made quick work fastening the sheets to the ceiling. The most time consuming part was taking measurements and cutting holes for the lights and AC vents. Next, it's time to cover the walls. In the living room, I'm using LP Smart Side, which is an exterior rated sheathing that looks kind of like the old T111. Smart Side is 3 8 of an inch thick and is very sturdy in case I need to hang anything on the walls in the future. It is also tongue and groove, so I don't need to hide the seam in between the sheets, which saves a lot of time. Using a drill and a jigsaw makes quick work of cutting holes for outlets and switches. In the bedrooms, I'm using 5-8 sheetrock with square edges. I'm going to apply trim strips over the joints to give these rooms a board and batten aesthetic. A huge benefit with this style is I won't have to tape and float any joints. Now it's time to paint the ceiling and walls. Make sure to use the correct primer for sheetrock. The beadboard and the wood siding came pre-primed so we can just get straight to painting on those. I'm using white for the beadboard ceilings and antique white for the walls.
Once the paint is dried, it is time to trim out the electrical. I'll install switches and outlets, as well as lights and fans. This is really starting to look like a home. If you have electricity, this would be a great time to check all of your outlets and switches to make sure that they are functioning correctly. Finally, we are ready to install the doors and trim. The doors are super convenient because they have the trim pre-installed. They have split jams, which means they come apart for easy installation. Simply split the door jam and install the side that the door is mounted to. Once you have the door shimmed and secured, you can install the other half of the door jam. I like to take my time with the doors to make sure that they are level and closed correctly. Then I use 18 gauge trim nails to secure the trim. Now it's time for the baseboards. The floor was sanded and sealed before I painted, and because I like the look of natural concrete, I'm going to keep it as my finished floor. This means once I install the baseboard, I don't need shoe molding. To save time, I painted the baseboards outside before I installed them. Once they are nailed into place, I will come back and putty the holes and run a bead of caulk along the top. The crown molding is simply 1x4s that I stained to match the cabinets. Then I gave them two coats of sealer to give them a nice shine. I recruited a few hands to help attach the crown molding. The electric nailer makes quick work of installing the trim. I love the warm finish that the wood provides, and it matches the rustic appeal of the beadboard ceilings. I ripped 5mm underlayment into 2 inch strips to cover the joints in the sheetrock. The plywood is the same thickness as the top of the baseboard, so it makes a seamless transition. I painted the trim strips outside and then attached them with the trim nailer. This process is super easy and I love the board and batten aesthetic. I hope you enjoyed the unconventional methods that I used to finish the interior of my house. From the exposed high ceilings and durable wood siding in the main room to the rustic beadboard and wood trim in the bedrooms. All of the finished materials were chosen for a balance of price, practicality, and aesthetic. Tell us how you would have finished this house in the comment section below. In our next video, we will be installing cabinets and countertops to make a beautiful kitchen. Until next time, dude, we can build it. In this video, we'll show you how we installed a backsplash in the kitchen. If you like this kitchen, check out our previous video where we install the cabinets and countertops. Since this is a unique house, I chose a unique solution. 
we're using roofing metal for the backsplash. It has a smooth ceramic coated surface that is durable and easy to clean. The best part is this entire project is under $100. The distance between the countertop and the bottom of the cabinet is 17 inches. Our roofing metal supplier was able to cut the metal to the correct height. This is a big help because it reduces the amount of metal that I have to cut. Now I need to get a measurement and cut it at the correct length. Next, it's time to cut holes for the outlets and switches. I'm using a sheet metal nibbler to cut the holes. This is much easier than using shears for this part. Always test fit the piece and make adjustments as needed. I'm taping off around the edges in case some adhesive squishes out. I'm using heavy duty liquid nails to glue the backsplash into place. Using a trowel helps evenly spread the adhesive onto the wall. Now, I will carefully set the metal into place and press it into the wall until it's smooth. I really enjoyed peeling off the protective film to see the final product. Now I can put the outlet and switch plates back on, which will also help hold the metal into place. I'm going to install a small piece of metal to cover the wall under the vent hood. Now, let's repeat the same process on the other side. Let's talk about some difficulties that came up and how we solved them. The first issue was figuring out what material to use. I wanted something inexpensive and easy to work with, but I also wanted it to be durable and look high end. We considered tile, wallpaper, and decorative panels but none of them met all the requirements. I finally decided to use roofing metal because it comes in a variety of colors, is cheap, and is durable. To make it look high-end, I decided to keep the metal flat instead of ribbed, like on a roof, and attach it in a way that gives a seamless look. In 
In addition to the outlets, I need to mark the location of the window and cut the hole for it. I will use sheet metal shears for these long straight cuts. The next obstacle was figuring out how to attach the metal to the wall. I really didn't want to use screws or other fasteners that would be exposed because I really want a sleek, modern look. So we decided to use adhesive instead. We tried different adhesives to see which would stick the best, and that's how we chose liquid nails. The install is super easy with just a few basic hand tools required. What's great is this entire project cost less than $100 and was completed in just a few hours. I removed the window trim before installing the backsplash to hide the cuts in the metal. I'm going to go ahead and finish painting the wall behind this area before I reinstall the trim. Now it's time to nail the window trim back into place. After the backsplash is in place, we sealed it to the countertops with silicone, that way water cannot get behind the cabinets. I chose black silicone to hide the gap between the countertop and the wall. The black silicone is not as forgiving as clear silicone, so I had to be very careful not to make a mess. Overall, this is a simple and affordable way to add a unique touch to your kitchen. This is a 1,500 square foot, three bed, two bath shop home that is wind rated at 150 miles an hour. I'm going to be giving you the full price breakdown from the house pad to the finishing touches and everything in between. I really appreciate everyone tuning in, so sit back, relax, and let's get into this build. When you start the house building process, the first thing to consider is the construction site. Depending on the property that you end up purchasing, there can be a huge variance in how much time, money, and prep needs to be done before you're actually ready to build the house. I dug a pond, as you can see right here, to build up my house pad and to put dirt down for driveways. And I also buried my utilities over 600 feet to get to where the house is currently. So my site prep was a little more time consuming and expensive than what most people might find. Now that we're done talking about dirt, I have some actual numbers from the foundation up of what it costs to build this house. Starting with the foundation, I used lumber that I used from previous projects to build the concrete forms. So I didn't actually spend any money on lumber. And I also used vegetable oil to oil the forms up. That way when I'm done pouring concrete, I can reuse those boards again in the future. There are plenty of areas that I save money by providing labor and expertise myself. And then there are also some areas where I hired a professional. One of those areas was hiring a plumber, especially for the plumbing rough in, which goes in the ground under under the foundation and then stubs up through the concrete. This is not an area where I wanted to make a costly mistake and have a pipe coming up, say an inch or two inches away from where it's supposed to be. You don't want a toilet stubbed up where you should have a wall at. So I hired out the plumbing to a professional plumber. Materials and labor cost me $2,800 to get the rough in in the slab complete. And while he was here with the machine, I had him go ahead and dig the footers around the perimeter of the concrete forms. The footers are one foot deep and one foot wide, and they have two continuous runs of rebar in them. The rebar costs $248. We also installed plastic vapor barrier underneath to keep moisture from permeating up through the slab. 
the moisture barrier cost $138. The concrete slab is six inches thick, which is thicker than the required four inches. The concrete with the added fiberglass reinforcement came out to 62.19. Pouring and finishing concrete requires a lot of skilled labor. So once again, I hired professionals. The concrete finishers charged $1,050 for their labor. The house itself is a tubular steel building that I ordered from Safeguard Metal Buildings. I really like the tube steel buildings because they go up quick, they're termite, rot, and mold resistant, and they're rated for 130 to 160 mile an hour winds. The building itself was $15,500, including shipping and installation on site. The install crew was very efficient and had the entire building assembled in one day. I provided custom residential doors for the install crew to install. The three exterior doors cost a total of $971. I do not like carrying keys with me everywhere I go, so I splurged a little bit and got electronic deadbolts. The deadbolts and exterior door handles cost a total of $226. From there, I added energy efficient vinyl windows. I purchased all the windows from Lowe's for $1,389. I did have to buy some extra J channel to trim out the windows at a cost of $230. Now, it's time to frame the inside of the house. All the lumber for framing the inside of the house cost a total of $2,120. I was able to get a few friends together and we had the entire inside framed up in just a couple of days. Framing is one of the more satisfying trades to do because at the end of the day, you can look around and see all the progress that you actually made. It's also something that's easy to go back and fix if you happen to mess something up. So you don't have to be super precise like you do with the plumbing that's in the slab. Speaking of plumbing, I had my plumber come back out for a cost of $4,800, which included materials and labor, to do the entire top out and get this house ready for the rough-in inspection. He also installed the tub and shower kit for the guest bathroom, which cost me $788. I own an air conditioning company, so we handled installing the air conditioning and ventilation ourselves. All of the materials for all of the AC and ventilation cost just under $7,000. This includes the package unit, all of the associated duct work, the thermostat, the bathroom vents, the stove hood vent behind me, and the vent for the dryer. Luckily, my buddy Jay is an electrician, so I also had help on doing the electrical rough in. He gave me a discount on the labor and the total for all of my materials and labor came out to $8,000. Once all the rough ends are complete, it was time for me to schedule the rough end inspection. We passed our inspection on the first try and now it's time to insulate the house. Every building requires a moisture barrier to keep moisture from penetrating through the walls and into the home. I decided to use closed cell foam to provide both the moisture barrier and insulation to the entire exterior of this metal building. I have two inches of closed cell insulation on the walls and the roof. And then I have an additional four inches of open cell insulation on the ceiling in here, which provides extra insulation and noise reduction. Surprisingly, it's actually cheaper to hire a professional to do all your spray foam. You could buy DIY kits, but you're going to spend almost twice as much money to get the same amount of spray foam insulation. And you're also going to have to do all the work yourself. My spray foam contractor charged me a total of $9,300 to install all the spray foam for me. I installed fiberglass insulation bats in the framed out sections of all of my exterior walls and in my interior wall compartments for noise reduction. This gives my exterior walls an R value of R26. The extra installation costed $1,154. Up next is the ceiling. I save time and money by using a primed ply bead, also known as a bead board for the ceiling. I got the material from Home Depot for a total cost of $595. Once again, I got a few buddies together and we were able to install all the ceilings in just one day. This is much easier, quicker, and cleaner than doing sheetrock. In the living room, I chose to install LP Smart Side for a strong, durable finish. Smart side is technically an exterior siding and it has a tongue and groove system to where you don't have any joints in between the boards. This saves a little time and money. The smart side cost a total of $640.
In the guest bedroom, we used 3 8 plywood for all the interior walls. This was sort of an experiment to see how the plywood would look compared to sheetrock. It's also a very durable finish. The plywood cost $326. In the remaining rooms, I used exterior grade sheetrock. Exterior sheetrock is different than interior sheetrock. Interior sheetrock has little bevels to where you can tape and put mud to float your interior wall. Exterior sheetrock is a little different. It has square edges, so they just butt up to each other, and there's no beveled area for sheetrock tape or mud. What I'm going to do is come back and put trim strips over the butt joints on all the sheetrock. That way, I don't have to tape, mud, or float any sheetrock in my house. This will save me a lot of time and headache and a lot of mess, and also it'll give a neat board and batten aesthetic. All the sheetrock cost $1,305. Now it's time for paint. I sprayed 20 gallons of Glidden interior paint on the spray foam ceiling to make it all black. The smart side in the living room and the beadboard in the ceilings were already primed, so I only had to prime the sheetrock walls and then paint all the surfaces. All of the paint for the entire house came to just under $1,000. Most of my interior doors are 34 inches wide. I had to custom order those through a local door shop at a cost of $170 a piece. I installed all the interior doors myself for a total of $850. All of the interior door knobs cost an additional $65. As we finish up this build, it's time to think about trim. The window stools and all of the interior trim for the windows cost $256. Door casing and all of the baseboard for the house cost a total of $363. I installed all of this trim myself, which is a bit of a time-consuming task, but it saved me a lot of money and labor. Next up is the crown molding. I purchased one by fours from Home Depot and used leftover stain and sealer to make them match the cabinets. Then I tacked them into place with my brad nailer. This was a very simple and efficient process and all of the crown molding only cost me $125. I hired a professional to build the shower. It's a huge peace of mind knowing that this is done correctly and professionally and I'll never have to worry about this shower ever again. The custom tile shower costs $4,835 for materials and labor. I also paid a professional to sand and seal the concrete floors at a cost of $1,000. I also opted for custom alder wood cabinets, both top and bottom matching throughout the house. That means the bathrooms, the kitchen, and the laundry room all have matching custom cabinets. All of the cabinets cost a total of $8,545. That includes them coming out to install them. Since the cabinets were unfinished wood, I went ahead and spent $200 on wood conditioner, stain, and sealer. I got some friends to come over and help me stain all the cabinets, and then came back and put two coats of a high gloss sealer to seal in all the stain and keep water and other liquids from soaking into the cabinets in the future. The countertops was one of the most difficult choices to make of this entire build. I definitely wanted to go with a quartz countertop because it's man-made and non-porous, so it has the lowest maintenance of any of the natural stone countertops out there. After going out to the yard and looking at all the different materials that they had on hand, I decided to go with this speckled black quartz, which I really, really like. The quartz countertops, including the sinks, came out to a total of $4,742. Personally, I really like the idea of saving both space and money when building a house, so I opted for an instant water heater. This takes up very little space on the wall and is actually cheaper than a good sized tank water heater. The instant water heater costs $459. In the kitchen, I chose a sleek, modern, all-in-one faucet at a cost of $199. In the bathrooms, I chose brush bronze faucets at a cost of $60 a piece for a total of $180. For the tub and the shower, I chose all-in-one valves because they only require one penetration and they have a more modern look. In total, the shower and bathtub faucets cost $186. The toilets cost $199 each for a total of $398. 
I spent $200 building shelving in the closet. I do plan on going back and upgrading that in the future. The last thing that I installed was shower curtain rods at a cost of $45 a piece for a total of $90. So after adding everything up, this entire house cost me a grand total of $88,129. There are some areas that I certainly could have saved a little bit of money, like the custom walk-in shower, the custom cabinets, and the granite countertops to have kept this entire build at under $80,000. That being said, I'm glad I splurged a little bit to get some higher end finishes. I hope you enjoyed this video and tune back in for more episodes of Dude We Can Build It.